This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to Roots and All. This week's guest is permaculture designer and author of The Plant Lover's Backyard Forest Garden, Pippa Chapman. Growing our own food is becoming more and more important, and Pippa has tips on creating a year-round food forest that is low maintenance and good for wildlife, that can work in a variety of aspects, and that is an enjoyable and beautiful space for people too. I've asked this question of guests before, but I think the answer varies from person to person. So first up, I ask Pippa for what her definition is of a forest garden. That's an interesting question, and I think there's probably quite a few purist forest gardener practitioners who would probably look at some of my forest gardens and question whether they were really forest gardens. I think my approach is that forest gardening is really about looking at the ecology of a woodland, of a forest, and looking at some of the patterns of how plants grow within that woodland so it's all about the multiple layers so the seven layers within a forest garden so there's the upper canopy of the large trees the lower canopy of the smaller trees then there's shrubs and under those we've got herbaceous plants ground cover plants plants that grow in the root zone and then there's climbers as well that will grow up between all of those layers So that is the traditional view of the forest garden. But I don't feel that there's anyone really that says a forest garden is only a forest garden if it includes all of those seven layers. So I quite often in my forest garden designs, I don't have an upper canopy layer because I don't have the room for large trees. So we have a a canopy layer, but it might even be a dwarf fruit tree. So this idea of forest gardening being on a forest scale, I don't think that always has to apply. My forest gardens are much smaller. Uh, And also, I think when I first started with forest gardening, I had this sort of real feeling that everything had to be edible. Every single plant had to be edible. But actually, as I learned more about it and I gained more experience, I realized that actually it's just that plants have some use, you know, contribute something to the ecology of the forest garden. So there's plants that are pollinators as well, some fix nitrogen and other nutrients. Um, so the, there's all sorts. There's also things like willow for weaving. So it's all about the forest garden being in some way useful. So because some people also term them food forests, but actually I prefer the term forest gardens because the focus might not always be food as well. So I hope that helps a little bit in answering that question. It definitely does. Thank you. And there's a lot to unpack there. But I suppose first off, I've just finished reading a brilliant book called Something Like How Women Can Save the Planet. And when you start reading the book, the author says, actually, this isn't a book about how women can save the planet. I just called it that because I wanted to draw people's attention to the book. And so I know (laughs) book titles are not always 100% literal, but your book title refers to plant lovers. And I wondered if that was because forest gardens can sometimes be limited in their plant palettes. Is that the case? Yes, my background is ornamental horticulture. So that was where my training was. And initially, I did garden designs that were purely aesthetic, you know, it was just about how they look. And even though I changed the way that I managed gardens, over time, I became organic. And then I was looking at regenerative ways to improve soil uh, and soil life. I was still focusing on the ornamentals. And then when I first learned about permaculture and forest gardening I sort of almost went to the other extreme so everything had to be edible or have some purpose and what I found was that there's just many shades of green within a forest garden which is fantastic but the the focus is always on the food element of it or how useful the plants are and for me it's just really important that it looks really attractive as well And my background is I've run a plant nursery for the last 10 years. I've got a real passion for plants. I love everything about different leaf shapes and textures and flower colours and all of that. And I just really wanted to bring that into my forest gardens. So initially, my book was actually going to be called Forest Gardening in Small Spaces. 
but when I was chatting with my editor you know she said actually I really want to bring in the fact that it is all about the passion for plants and sort of that's what makes it different to a lot of other forest gardening books is it's actually very much about making it a really attractive garden as well because I think really if we want more people to adopt this way of growing particularly if it's it's not on an allotment somewhere or you know a bit of field to one side of the house this is your main garden you know if people are going to grow forest gardens they have to look just as beautiful as if it was a regular garden so yeah that's very much why that part became part of the title of the book and the pictures that you do have in the book are beautiful you talk about the seven f's that the garden should provide so as you say it doesn't need to be necessarily all food and if people are interested in those seven f's they can buy the book but one of the ones that you mentioned is fiber and that actually really intrigued me as it was one that i hadn't considered before and so i wondered if maybe we could just talk about that one Yes, yeah, definitely. I'm really quite interested in forest gardens having other sort of um, focuses. So not just the food element, but I particularly love weaving and natural crafts. And so I wanted to look at the kind of fibre element as well. So it could be growing firewood, you might grow willow for weaving, also things like nettles for making twine. Um, so it's just sort of really putting the focus on looking at certain plants and what they can offer from the forest garden as well. So I like to make obelisks. I also like to make baskets um, things like hazel to provide rods. So it's sort of looking at the usefulness of what the plant produces, even things like procosmia, you can weave into small baskets as well. So it's kind of putting that focus on forest gardening doesn't all have to be about food. There can be lots of other things that you get from your forest garden as well. And even now I'm looking at doing a a weaving and dyeing themed forest garden. So the focus really there is about textiles and craft and how those plants can come together in a forest garden setting. So still trying to maximise their wildlife benefits, using all the layers within a forest garden in just the same way as if you were growing edible plants, but instead the main focus is on growing dye plants. So adding in things like dyer's coreopsis and Japanese indigo, things like that, and also some of the tree crops as well. Um, I've been, it's sort of quite new to me, so I've been learning about dye plants and all the different tree roots and things like that that you can use for making dyes as well. Yeah, that sounds amazing, actually. Where I work, there's a dyeing bed. We we kind of laugh and say we shouldn't really call it the dyeing bed because it sounds like it's all (laughs) keeling over, but there is one here and, and I'm just learning a tiny bit about it because somebody comes in and teaches it and it's, it's amazing i absolutely love it so uh, yeah I, I see why you'd be really intrigued by that so i just want to pick up on one more thing that you've mentioned and that is the size of a forest garden and i think people do feel that they need to be a decent scale in order to work but is there a minimum size that you could get away with as i mentioned before i think for me it's more about the looking at the ecology of, of a woodland and trying to use that in your own garden following the the layered system so I mean for me I'd say one tree guild would be classed as a forest garden because you're still taking your inspiration and just for anyone who hasn't come across the term before a a guild is a sort of collection of plants grown in a bit the same theory as companion planting really so that each plant can help support some part of the the grouping you know it brings something to the grouping and that you're trying to fit in all the layers as well so it's sort of a collection of plants so usually you get one tree in the middle And then you get some shrubs around that and the ground cover herbaceous and root plants growing around that as well. So it's about bringing a a collection of plants together, all using different vertical spaces, but all working together and supporting each other. So there might be a plant in there that fixes nitrogen as well. So that can bring that element to the group. There might be a plant that attracts pollinators at about the same time as the fruit trees flowering so it sort of attracts more pollinators in to increase pollination so even if all you've got is one fruit tree in your garden or it might not even be a fruit tree you know it might be that your guild has another kind of tree in it It might be a nut tree or or to have some other kind of use 
but that it's sort of based around your starting point is the tree and then you build other plants in around that. So yeah, even if you've only got, I've designed a, a sort of family friendly forest garden and that's got, you know, one dwarf apple tree in it. And then I've built other layers around that sort of even bean wigwams for children to run through that has annuals. You know, this doesn't mean everything in a forest garden has to be perennial. So you can have annuals in there as well. So that's a very small area. You know, I think it's two metres by two metres, very small area. I personally would still class that as a forest garden. There might be others who disagree, but uh, for me, it's still about using the layers and looking at the uses of the plants and how they work together. Yeah, and it's interesting that you mentioned a guild, actually, because I think that's a term that maybe some people haven't come across. And you do introduce concepts in the book that I think might not be that familiar to gardeners who don't come from a forest garden background. And there was a couple of them I was intrigued by, and I wondered if you could just have a quick chat about them. And one of them was keyhole beds, and the other one was the lasagna bed. Oh, yeah. So the keyhole beds are one of my most favourite design features. I really love using keyhole beds. The the idea is that you're trying to maximise your growing space. So instead of having a path that maybe runs all the way through a bed, you're wanting a path that you can access the centre of the bed but with using up as little space as possible as path. So you sort of walk into the circle in the middle. So it looks very much like a keyhole. So it's like a long straight path with a circle at the end. So the idea is you can walk into this area. You've got the the circle of the keyhole to be able to move around in all directions and access all of the beds without stepping on the ground as well, because you don't want to compact it. And then you can turn around and come back the way that you came rather than the usual path, which would run straight through a bed, therefore taking up a lot more space. And it means you can really be able to access parts of the garden that maybe you might normally have thought of having stepping stones. I don't particularly like stepping stones. They very quickly get covered up by other vegetation. You can't remember where they are. You know, you sort of feel like you're balancing and falling over. So the keyhole beds are just a really nice way to access gardens but without taking up too much space as path oh and the other one so lasagna beds so the idea is particularly bringing the sort of no dig way of gardening into forest gardening as well and you're trying to build the soil you're trying not to disturb the soil life but sometimes if you want to grow nutrient demanding plants uh, particularly some annuals but but also if you're starting a brand new forest garden and you've just got very thin very poor soil you know we always try and say work with what you've got but sometimes what you have just isn't good enough you can layer up layers so you can put cardboard down first without having to do any weeding or anything you can just cut down what's already there lay on some cardboard and that will kill off the plants that are there but without taking the nutrients away. So it's sort of, you're composting them in situ really. So you put the cardboard down, then you layer on top, whatever you can get your hands on really, whether it's cut grass or partially composted waste, or could be, you know, if you have enough homemade compost and you can sort of put all these layers on together and let those compost in situ really, rather than having to take them all away, compost them and bring them back. So it's called lasagna gardening because it's all about putting on different layers and if you are wanting to plant it to it straight away then you're best to use partially rotted organic matter just because otherwise it can be a bit too fresh for the things that are in there and you can put some well rotted compost in your planting holes so that hopefully by the time the roots get out to everything else it's a bit more composted but it's really about adding nutrition to the soil but by adding it in layers on top rather than digging it in. I think you've got some really good practical stuff in the book but actually you hit the nail on the head when you said that you'd spoken to the publisher and it was this combination of practical ideas but actually there was this aesthetic that ran through the book and through your work. I really like the idea of going into the design process and again your design process is very appealing particularly to me because I'm not actually that artistic and I thought you had some really good ideas about how to tease out the best ways of managing a site and one of the ones I really liked was the random assembly idea and I couldn't resist asking you about that. 
Well, I think as a designer, you know, you're supposed to say, oh, yes, I think very carefully about every element within the garden. And I think sometimes as well, when you've been designing for quite a while, you just intuitively, having gone through a lot of of thought processes and, and learning from mistakes in the past, you can easily look at a site and think, oh, yes, that'll work there, that'll work there, this'll work here. But actually, if you're starting from scratch, and sometimes when it's a garden that you've had for a while, and you've already got um, preconceived ideas of what the garden should be, it's very hard to know exactly where to put everything in a way that will give the most beneficial relationships for each element. So sometimes it's great to just get a list of the elements that you want within the garden and then just sort of almost mix them up and randomly put them in places. And some things you might think, well, of course, I can't put the pond right outside the front door. You know, that won't work. But can sometimes find relationships that you just wouldn't have thought of had you not gone through that really random process. And and I found this with doing some border design as well. When we first moved to the house that we're in currently, we had some really huge borders and we had chosen all the plants that we wanted but we just decided that actually instead of doing a design we were just going to grab the plants throw them all over the bed and just plant them where they landed and through watching how that border developed we learned about how certain plants grew really well together that we wouldn't have necessarily thought of had we very carefully sat down and worked out, you know, what plant we wanted to go next to each other. So sometimes I think just to get a new perspective and, you know, just to to make the process more creative, it's just really fun to just go with totally random ideas and see see what comes from those. I was going to ask you about some of your kind of essential perennial food plants, but because the remit of your forest garden is so wide, I wondered if maybe you could just recommend two or three plants that you would say I have to have those or those are really good plants for people to include if they're dipping the toe into the water of this? Quite often in forest gardening people get very excited about the trees and I think maybe my background in maybe some of the more ornamental herbaceous plants mean I get more excited about the herbaceous side so I think quite often I will put an apple tree in my designs because actually that is one of the trees that we use the most But if you are asking me what my favourite tree that I use in designs would be, I would say something like um, an amelanchia, so uh, June berry. And you can eat the fruit of those if you can get them before the birds. But also it's just such a beautiful tree. So you've got the buds, the bronzy buds early in the year, and then you've got the white flower. And then as it's going over at the end of the year in autumn, you just get the really beautiful autumn colours. So that's one of them. Another one would be a wine berry. So that's um, one of the rubus. And it's just a really beautiful edible berry plant. So it still has really, really tasty berries, but the actual stems are really attractive as well. They sort of in the sunlight, they almost look like they're glowing red. You know, they're really beautiful plant and then for ground cover I would just always go with alpine strawberries they're just one of my most favorite plants because they're just so easy to grow and unlike normal cultivated strawberries you know they're very very low maintenance you don't have to worry about disease they're just really prolific Uh, you don't have to worry about refreshing them every few years Uh, they're just such an easy plant to grow they can go a bit too rampant sometimes but uh, they're just really great along the path edge and just fantastic for just foraging and nibbling on as you're wandering around the forest garden doing your gardening perfect I love those plants too and they they do make good ground cover and they're great for kind of suppressing weeds and all the rest Mm -hmm. of it so yes I'm a big fan so my final question to you is Obviously, you have beautiful photos in your book, as I said, and I think some of them are of a garden that you've worked on and designed, and it is fantastic, and it's really, really an attractive garden. If people did want to see examples of forest gardens in action, none kind of spring to mind for me. Are there any that you could recommend people could go and visit and to see the possibilities that are available to them? Yes, absolutely. There there are a few sort of networks. There's a 
Forest Garden Network. I'm not sure how active that is at the moment. That I think was uh, run by Martin Crawford at the Agroforestry Research Trust. Uh, I'm not sure if that list is still available online. I haven't looked that recently. But the Permaculture Association, um, they have lists of, they have something called the Land Project. So it's about learning and demonstrating permaculture and a lot of those gardens are either forest gardens or have forest garden elements within them. So uh, it's worth looking on the Permaculture Association Land Network page. And yeah, there's there's loads of sort of forums on social media, on Facebook and things like that, where you can go and people will post pictures about what they're doing in their forest gardens at the moment. So there are quite a few lists starting to come together. I think in the last sort of five, 10 years, it's really there are a lot more forest gardens than there used to be. So there's, yeah, there's, there's usually one fairly close by if you wanted to go and have a look. But, you know, as I said before, there's such a, a fantastic range. You know, I, I have forest gardens that I've designed, which are totally wild and very natural. So sort of almost just look like a natural woodland right down to some much more formal gardens where there's a lot more ornamental elements in there. So, you know, it's really great to go and look at a different range of forest gardens um, all over the place. So, yeah, it's well worth doing a bit of a, a bit of a tour if you can. Thank you very much to Pippa for sharing her expertise. And I do recommend her book and website to see how she balances productivity with design to produce some really welcoming and attractive spaces. Thanks to you for listening. Now, here's the fantastic Dr. Ian Bedford with advice on how to make your food forest function even more healthily. Alongside shrubs, trees and ornamental plants, many of Britain's 23 million gardens are perfect places for producing some homegrown fruit and veg. And with so many obvious benefits, it's certainly worth having a go if you're not doing it already. Particularly since nowadays, there's many varieties available that have been produced for different growing methods, particularly within a home garden whether it be in a pot or container, or in a large open bed. Without having any prior experience though, there's likely to be a few challenges to overcome, so it'll certainly be worth seeking a bit of advice on what the plants might need in regards to soil type, watering, feeding, and the level of sunlight they're exposed to. It'll also be worth finding out what creatures might consider your plants as their food and how you might be able to protect your plants from the damage they cause. But realistically, that shouldn't be too difficult, since homegrown produce will certainly be much simpler to keep an eye on than commercially grown crops, and so potential problems could be averted or dealt with more easily. So by recognising the creatures that we'll call the plant pests when they first appear, and knowing a little bit about their life cycles, we can decide on a suitable method for controlling them, which for homegrown produce will always have the option of being chemical free. So, using cabbage as a good example, it'll attract many different pests that'll feed in different ways and on different parts of the plant, such as the leaf munchers, the butterfly moth larvae, leaf mining flies, and flea beetles, all of which could be blocked from accessing the plants with suitable nettings. And the sapsuckers, the aphids and the whitefly that, although finer netting might block their access to the plants, infestations could be removed with a soap-based spray. But then there's the pests that can't always be seen, the ones that live underground and feed on the plant roots. And for cabbages, these will be the maggots of the cabbage root fly that hatch from eggs laid by adult flies around the base of the plants. Although netting might prevent the flies from accessing the plants, they could also be prevented from laying their eggs into the soil by placing a fabric disc called a cabbage collar on the ground around the stem of the plants, or by spreading a layer of non-absorbent substrate around the stems. So whether it's cabbages or any other homegrown fruits and veg, it's always going to be best to do a bit of research first on their potential plant pests. Then, as the proverb states, <laughs>
To be forewarned is to be forearmed. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.